Hi everyone and welcome back to Flashback! Today I'm flashing back to the future! Wait, why just am I subjecting myself to this game? You know what? I can just leave! I'll even just skip this episode! Uh, um, fine, I'll, I'll do it. Just please don't hurt me. <clears throat> okay, uh, let's get this started. First off, let's start off from my research. Even on Back to the Future Wiki, I can't find a basic history on this game. Oh well, for this episode, I'm going to have to start off with the plot and gameplay of this game then. The faster I go over this game, the quicker I can go back in time and stop myself from ever discovering this game. In the game, you take the role of a time-traveling teenager named Marty McFly, who doesn't really look like Marty McFly, who was trapped in the past in the year 1955 and must venture through various stages, most of which happen to be straight down to up-scrolling and avoiding obstacles and collecting objects all the while. Also included in the game after three street stages are completed are mini game based stages, where you have to reach a goal of a target amount of items collected to move on to the next more difficult set of street based stages. The street stages are filled with clock icons that the Marty character must collect to keep the picture of himself and his two siblings that is displayed at the bottom of the screen from fading away. If he fails to keep said picture from fading away through the clock collecting, you will lose a life by it fading away into non-existence. And having to start the stage over again, fading would also occur if the character failed to complete the stage before the timer expired. Collecting 100 clocks would restore the picture to full sharpness no matter what state was. There are also enemies of all types trying to stop Marty from reaching the end of the long street stage. Those include bullies, hula hoop girls, moving men carrying a pane of glass, and giant killer bees. Marty can also pick up a bowling ball and skateboard, only after acquiring a bowling ball previously, to fight back at these enemies who are trying to stop him all the while. The first set of streets end at Loose Cafe, which is a mini-game type of stage where Marty behind a counter must toss milkshakes at various bullies trying to get him. If he is able to hit at least 50 of them before they reach the counter to attack him, you can advance to the next set of street stages. There are also super milkshakes that a waitress will sometimes deliver to Marty's counter that can be used to take down bullies on the stage instantly. The player had to be careful not to hit the waitress, or else she would churn the other way. As the player advanced, some bullies would toss milkshakes back at the character, whom if he was hit, he would be stalled for a few minutes as he webs himself off. If even one bully succeeded at reaching the counter, Marty would be thrown out of Loose Cafe by the seat of his pants, and be made to redo the last street if he hit less than 50 bullies. Hitting 99 bullies automatically ended the sub-game and gave the player a bonus for surviving the onslaught. The rest of the game follows a similar formula to this, with street-based stages, minigame stage following, and needing a certain amount achieved in said minigames to move on to the next phase of the game. Some of the other levels in the game include a level at Hill Valley High School, where Marty has to use a book to block at least 50 kisses coming from his mother, in which if he lets even one kiss slip by, he would be out of the sub-game and have to do the preceding street. As in the fight at Luz Cafe, should Marty block 99 kisses, he would be awarded a bonus. The penultimate sub-game was the Enchantment Under the Sea dance, where the player moves the guitar that Marty is playing to catch notes, sharps, and flats that are coming at him, with a song that sounds amazingly close to Johnny Be Good. That's you, you know, with Chuck Berry, the guy from the 50s. Uh, yeah. As in the other two, failing the sub game would cause a redo. But this was different as Marty needed to complete it before the song ending. No bonus was awarded in this case. Rather, the player needed to fill a thermometer type love meter where missing notes would cause it to decrease and catching notes would increase it. When the meter topped out, George and Lorraine would kiss. The final mini-level of the game involves Marty having to drive the DeLorean up to 88 miles per hour while avoiding lightning that would slow him down all the while. The climatic scene would show the DeLorean blasting off into the future and leaving behind the signature flaming tire tracks. Now, here's a bit of a change from my usual flashback formula. It's only going to be done in episodes about bad games, actually. I'm going to go over the main criticism that this game received from other video game reviewers. Most, if not all, reviewers have given negative views of this game, most notably for its poor relation to the film and for its overly difficult gameplay. Well, it has the fringes of some themes from the movie. 
If anything, it has a poor representation of what actually occurred in the 1985 film it was supposed to be based on. This has some similarity to the 1983 Atari video game E.T., where producers felt it would solely sell on brand association to the hit movie, and the game designers were only given five weeks in order to produce product to get it on the shelves for the 1982 Christmas shopping rush. Reviewers also cited this game as virtually unlike the film, and was a major contributor to an economic downturn known as the Great Video Game Crash in 1983. Although the economic impact of the Back to the Future NES game was as in cute, LJN, the company that sponsored, went bankrupt in 1994. Like many LJN games, the product was outsourced in the Back to the Future case to Beam Software. Now, here's what the co-writer, Bob Gale, had to say about this game. The LJN people did not want any input from the filmmakers. But they promised to show us the game when it was ready. I was outraged when they showed it to me and had all kinds of things I wanted changed. But of course we were told it was too late to change anything. I actually did interviews telling fans not to buy it because I felt so ashamed that a product this bad would have our brand on it. No, my opinion. There's not really much to say about this game, only why is Marty wearing a black shirt? Why is Wolverine in this and that that in a pink shirt? Seriously, Logan, if you think a pink shirt will make you look manlier, it's not. It's only making you look like Vegeta when he wears a pink shirt. And that's not saying much. Also, this game is extremely difficult in actually trying to get past certain obstacles. And even the most ridiculous things can kill you, from bees to hitting a park bench. I mean, seriously, I know who Marty McFly is. And this kid is not him. Second off, bowling balls? What the hell do bowling balls have to do with the film? Nothing. Marty never went bowling in the first film, nor any of the other films. And why would you need a bowling ball to ride a skateboard? Ugh. This is just giving me a headache. I'm Zeph the Panda. And I'm just gonna sign off and try to forget about this game. And think about the game Telltale made based off of the movie. Yeah, I'll do that. Anyway, I'll see you guys later. Bye.